I think I'm just realizing now, I don't know what I'm doing there. I think I'm just realizing now that <laughs> these are a lot of books. Hey, welcome back to my channel or hi if you're new. My name is Emma. Today I thought I would film what an English major has to read, which I thought would be kind of interesting since I am one of those things. Um, if anyone is wondering, I am currently in my third year of doing a kind of double major in English language and literature and classical studies, so the Greeks and the Romans uh, and the Egyptians, but we'll get there. But yeah, so for today I thought I would kind of just show what's on my syllabus, which are mostly novels. Obviously there's a lot of poetry, fragments, just like random stuff that's also on the syllabus, but for things that I can actually show and for example count towards my Goodreads challenge, I thought I would just go over them because people are curious and I feel like a lot of people don't actually know what English undergraduates or even graduates kind of study and read so I thought this would be kind of a cool video to explain and show that and I'm sure people are always curious and I'm always curious about what other people are studying as well so definitely let me know in the comments but um, yeah just for a little bit of kind of back story context wise what courses I'm actually taking this year what modules I'm taking um, so I have three different modules three different courses of literature this year that I've chosen to take, uh, which are actually required for my degree, but I did pick them. So we have American literature, British literature, and Renaissance literature, uh, which means that the rest of my classes are actually classical studies classes, and I do, uh, I'm taking a course in Athenian drama, so I just kind of, I'm gonna add in the plays that we're reading, but anyway, without further ado, let's get started. So the first book that I'm reading for my British literature course, which I actually just finished, is Beowulf. Um, obviously there's no author, no one really knows who wrote this, we can guess, but that's pretty much that. So because the British literature course is kind of supposed to be a survey from the very very early British in quotation marks times all the way to the present, we are starting with Beowulf, which is obviously a very old epic poem about, uh, it's, I mean it is about Beowulf and his heroics and his chivalry and his very nice values that he has but that definitely come into question when we talk about it in class. It is about him going over to this man named Hrothgar's hall that he has just built since it is being attacked by this monster slash man slash creature named Grendel. Um, and I really, I just, oh, this is like a side track, but I adore that name. I adore the name Grendel. If I have a cat, if I ever get a cat, which like I'm honestly planning on doing soon, do not tell my parents, but like, I think I want to name my cat Grendel. I just really like that name. Anyway, so Grendel is this huge monster, terrible man. He's said to have been descended from Cain, uh, obviously the biblical story. Cain kills his brother Abel, so he's descended from humanity's first murderer. Uh, and he is attacking the hall, and he is not only stealing 30 soldiers a night from Hrothgar's domain, He's actually eating them, stuffing them into this giant bag made from, I think, dragon scales, and taking them away back home. And it's just really funny to me because, like, how they're like Hrothgar's solution and his people's solution is just to kind of sleep in different rooms every night and hope Grendel doesn't find them, which seems so ridiculous to me that there's no, like, proper defense or, like, any organization at all. It's just, like, Grendel's coming, better sleep in the guest room tonight. Meanwhile, he just shows up and literally grabs these men, eats them, leaves their hands and feet, and runs away. Uh, so that's where Beowulf comes in, and obviously he deals with first Grendel, and then in the later half of the poem, there is a dragon that he has to fight. But um, I just thought it was really, honestly, a lot of it was pretty humorous to me. The parts with Grendel are very interesting. That's mostly what we're focusing on in class. Um, and yeah, so Beowulf is the first one. Next, this one is not a novel. It is again for Brit Lit. Uh, it is a compilation of poems. We only have to read a few, but they are from the lovely John Keats. I don't know in particular which ones we're reading. This is my very old battered copy of Keats' uh, works, so I'm excited. Probably we'll do his Ode to Nightingale because that's a very famous one, but John Keats is just a very lovely romantic poet. Lovely, I'm in love with this man, but it's fine. Uh, and he writes a lot about obviously romantic ideals and what was going on at the time period. Obviously he uh, unfortunately dies very young, I believe at the age of 24, to tuberculosis, so that's really sad. But he was a doctor, and he was a poet, and just, 
yeah. These next poems are for my American Literature course, and it is none other than Emily Dickinson and her poems. I believe we're reading four or five of her major poems. I'm not really sure what they are as of yet, but I'm glad I have this little anthology so I don't have to buy another one. But Emily Dickinson is obviously an American woman writer, writing in the time period of the 1850s. She was born in 1830, and she's just, yeah, she's from Massachusetts, and she's a really lovely lady. She was so reclusive that people in her town referred to her as the myth, which is relatable, that's pretty goals, but she actually writes a lot of the same things as Edgar Allan Poe and expresses a lot of the same sentiments. Unfortunately, we are not studying Poe in my American Lit class, which I'm really sad about, but at least we've got Dickinson. A novel that I have fortunately already read and that we're going to be studying in American literature is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Uh, obviously this one is very famous, I probably don't have to say a lot about this. We're following this young girl named Esther Greenwood as she's going through her life, she's growing up, and it just kind of chronicles Esther's problems, the way she deals with her life, leading to her ultimate breakdown and her kind of collapse and eventually uh, the, her time in psychiatric establishments and it's just really really haunting and like obviously Sylvia Plath famously sticks her head in an oven and you can obviously see in the Belger how kind of an event like that and a conclusion to the author's life like that is definitely shown through this work and what Plath writes and I'm just I'm kind of scared to get back into it it's not really a fun happy novel obviously but um, I am excited to kind of read it again because it's been a really long time since I've read it. Next, we've got, also for American literature, a little book from Hemingway, and that is In Our Time. So it's just a really, really tiny kind of compilation of short stories. These ones are more of his earlier works. I don't know in particular which ones we're studying here, but they are very, very short. Obviously, Hemingway, it's very blunt, it's very to the point, it's very simple language. Um, and I'm kind of excited because I have not read... I've not read any of these, so um, yeah, I think a lot of them do have to deal with like wartime scenarios or wartime events, but um, we will see. Uh, a poet and a writer that we're going to be studying in both British literature and American literature, which is very contested and very debated which one this man should be in, but obviously it is T.S. Eliot and some of his poems. We're going to be looking at The Wasteland, which we've looked at literally in every literature course that I've had so far in university, which um, you'd think would be kind of frustrating looking at the same piece of work again and again and again, but it's really not because The Wasteland is such this like huge, hugely, just huge in its own right and hugely intertextual as well and it reacts and kind of, I don't know, tangles itself up with so many other works and so many other concepts and pieces and parts of history that like you don't really get tired of studying it because every time you study it you learn something else about it, or you can look at it from a different angle. Uh, in Britlet, I believe we're also reading The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is one of, it's probably my favorite Eliot poem, I think. Um, but yeah, some people debate whether he should really be considered American, but um, obviously he's British, moved to America, but we are studying him in both courses. Uh, probably one of the most central texts I believe that we're going to be studying in my British literature class obviously comes from Shakespeare and uh, this year it's going to be King Lear which I am really excited about. I've actually never read King Lear. Obviously I know what happens. It's probably it's debatably Shakespeare's best uh, play but I've never actually read it uh, front to back so this will be really really interesting. Obviously Lear is just... Ooh, he's such like a cool character, but in like not not really like cool, but like so interesting. And um, we've already talked so much about this, even though it's not we haven't even read it yet in my British literature course. But in this one, he's already the teacher. He's already said that we're just gonna look a lot at identity because obviously this is a play about a king who goes mad because he doesn't know who he is. Um, they've, we've also been saying how it's a play about nothing, the word nothing and also the concept of nothing features so much in here and I'm just really, really excited. Um, I've over the summer gotten so much more into Shakespeare. I used to like vehemently hate Shakespeare but um, I'm just, I've had a change of heart and <laughs> I'm quite glad about that because this is definitely one of our main texts. It's one that he really wants people to write upon. So uh, this is actually the only Shakespeare that I have to read this year at all, I think. Yes. So we've got King Lear. Uh, the most modern novel that we're going to be reading in American literature, I believe this came out in 1989. 
Mine. It is beloved by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison did recently pass away this summer, so um, obviously this book is still relevant. It's still wonderful. I've never read any Toni Morrison, but I've always heard such amazing things about her and her work as well. Oh, sorry, 1988, my bad. But um, yeah, I actually have no idea what this is about. I am as clueless as anyone else who's never read Toni Morrison, but I am ready to have kind of my eyes opened and just, um, I'm excited about Beloved, so. One of the other main novels that we're going to be looking at in my Britlet class is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Um, I feel like this is also probably a text that you could complain has been overworked and overanalyzed a lot, especially since I think a lot of people read this in high school. I was not one of those people. I read it by myself, I think, and then I've actually had to read it again two years ago for a science fiction course that I took, but um, yeah, this is the only other time it's come up, so I'm going to be reading it for Britlet, and Frankenstein, obviously I love Frankenstein. I'm really happy that I'm going to be reading it. I hope it can fall sometime around Halloween, because I was actually planning on reading this for Halloween anyway, but um, yes. Mary Shelley is a goddess. I love you. I love you, Mary Shelley. A novel that I've never read before for American literature is The Scarlet Letter, obviously a very famous one. Nathaniel Hawthorne is a very well-known author, um, and a lot of people know the story, know what happens. I've personally never read it myself, so I'm hoping I'll enjoy it. I really don't know if I will. It doesn't really sound like my kind of novel. Works about Puritans, um, are very interesting to me. Puritan belief is really interesting to me, which is basically the belief that like uh, you, it has already been decided for you whether you are saved, whether you're going to heaven or hell, and nothing you can do in your earthly life can kind of sway that decision or change that outcome, which um, really makes problematic the idea of free will. However, someone who is Puritan would probably say that um, people who are saved or who are destined to go to heaven would already be acting in a kind of godly fashion. So kind of free will is forced upon you to be good if you think you're going to hell or heaven. Anyway, um, it's just super interesting. So I think I'll like it if I kind of just focus on the religious aspect of the Scarlet Letter, but um, we'll see. Another really famous book that we're going to be looking at is Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, and also Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. I think we're going to be looking a lot more at Harriet Jacobs, which is really cool, and I'm really glad. And um, I've never read either of these, so I'm, I'm hoping... I don't really know what I'm hoping. Obviously, I don't think these are texts that you, like, obviously will be happy about and enjoy, but they're just such important works. Um, these are definitely books that you just want to, like, spend a long time with and do a lot of other research aside from just read the text with it, so um, that's what kind of my plan is with this one and all the other ones, but yeah. Okay, finally we have a work from my Renaissance literature course, sorry they were like all at the bottom of the bundle, but that is Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. So uh, in my Renaissance course we actually have to give seminars, which is a little bit spooky and scary. My seminar, I've already been assigned it, I've actually picked it, um, is on the Fairy Queen. So I have to get up and talk about the Fairy Queen. Um, I don't really know particularly what I'm going to talk about yet, but that's kind of the gist. Obviously the Fairy Queen is also... Um, I'm... They're split into songs and split into books, and it's all about, you know, they're quite long as well, which is, you know, but um, I really, really loved Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock and Paradise Lost, and this loosely follows in the same tradition, same sort of style, so I'm really hoping I'll enjoy The Fairy Queen. The work that we're actually looking at right now in my Renaissance course is Utopia by Sir Thomas More. This is a little, little satire about um, an ideal society, an ideal country, an ideal world called Utopia, which obviously doesn't exist. Uh, Sir Thomas More is writing in 1516, uh, during the reign of Henry VIII, and obviously that is a very turbulent time and a very dangerous time to be kind of suggesting uh, reformation in any in any context to a king who has like literally beheaded so many people and is continuing to do so. Sir Thomas More actually, unfortunately, uh, that is how he meets his end. He is beheaded by Henry VIII. Um, not because he wrote this book, but just because he wouldn't sign documents being like, yes, the Church of England is a cool thing. Um, basically, if you don't know, in the Renaissance it was 
a really kind of turbulent time because Mr. Uh, Henry VIII over here obviously was not producing a male heir with a whole bunch of his wives and he wants to divorce Catherine, his first wife, and obviously the Pope is like, no, you can't divorce because Roman Catholicism is like, no divorce. But then Henry's like, you know what, I'm gonna create a new sect, I'm gonna create the Church of England, me, the monarch, is going to be head of this church and um, I am gonna get a divorce. And that is what happens and then it leads to all of these things, Protestantism, the Reformation, uh, so many things that are going on that like the renaissance let me just say the renaissance i have like no experience with i'm very not knowledgeable about this time in history or this time in literature or art or painting or literally anything it's not been something that's really interested me and i've been kind of really wary uh weary wary I'm an English major, I should know this, but, um, and really kind of hesitant and scared to take a course in Renaissance literature because I find it very, I find a lot of the material from this time period very dull and very dry and very, it just doesn't interest me and it's not compelling to me. Uh, Utopia, I found, was so, obviously it's really important and it presents a lot of important arguments and ideas and ways in which you should advise and kind of survey those in power but um it just like the writing and the poetry from this age i do not vibe with it that's what i'm trying to say so um i'm hoping i can kind of get more into fairy queen and other works but utopia was definitely a miss for me this it just really bored me more than anything else and having to talk about it in class in like a seminar little group is um it's not that enjoyable but obviously these are classes that i have to take for my degree so um, that's my little ramble on that, but we did read Utopia this week, and this is one that we're continuing on with the next few weeks. The main kind of central text of Renaissance literature, I suppose, and this is debated whether it really should be Renaissance literature or not, since uh, it's kind of restoration literature, but that's fine. Um, it is Paradise Lost by John Milton, and uh, as much as I just kind of complained about Renaissance literature a second ago, I adore this poem. Um, it is, uh, it's so good. I had to read this first year in my first year English course and I fell in love with it. I gave it five stars. I got to write an essay about it. I'm so excited to be able to write another essay about it. This uh, is a text that also is for Renaissance and for British literature as well. Obviously John Milton is British and I am just so excited to get back into it. It's been a year now since I've read it and I'm really excited to just read it again. If you don't know, Paradise Lost is just kind of an epic uh, retelling and kind of illustration of the fall of humanity, Satan's kind of creation of hell and of the city pandemonium and of his host of angels that fall from grace from God and just that whole kind of, the whole story of religious humanity. Um, it's really good. It's debatably the best English poem. I would probably disagree with that, but that's fine because I don't know anything. Um, a... I thought, I thought... Okay, I really... Am I stupid? Okay, why am I just figuring this out now? My whole life, I thought Samuel Beckett was French because he writes in French, which is... I guess that would make sense, but that was a stupid mistake. No, he was born in Ireland. Okay, well, you learn something new every day, because I'm like sitting here thinking, why is Samuel Beckett on my British literature course if he's French? But he just writes in French, which is really cool. The play that we are reading from Beckett, I believe this is the only play. No, no, King Lear, what am I doing? I've already actually read this last year for a course in space and time and physics in literature. Um, and it is Endgame and Act Without Words. Obviously Endgame is the primary focus, Act Without Words is literally one page because as it suggests, there is no dialogue. Uh, Endgame is a very, very bizarre kind of French absurdist play about, it, well it's about the end of the world, but it's about four people. I guess you can call them people. There is so much that you don't know in Beckett and so much just weird shit happening that like, obviously people study it, scholars are like yes this is what's happening blah 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 but that's the thing about English like it's so open to just interpretation and just everything so uh, Endgame is about four people who are trapped in a house where they can't leave but they can't stay uh, it's a play about really heavy topics and really kind of dismal depressing subjects and um, it's just it's kind of excruciating to read when you read it the first time because 
basically every exchange of dialogue seems so trivial, so unimportant, so painstakingly kind of awful to get through. The lines are mostly just one line kind of exchanges, which I think in a Greek play is called stoichomythia, uh, where people just kind of shoot back and forth and mirror each other's dialogue, and that's a lot what happens in Endgame. But um, once you kind of just ignore once you know what's going on and ignore the words that people are saying, you can get a better a better idea of it and kind of um, try and make sense of what is going on because, I mean, make sense and Samuel Beckett in the same sentence don't really make sense. But, um, yeah. The most modern work that we're reading for British literature, this is the last novel in the course. I've already read it. I read it this summer. I've talked about it a little in my August wrap-up, is Ghost Written by David Mitchell. I am so ecstatic that David Mitchell is on a syllabus for university. I adore this man, I adore his writing. One of my teachers last year actually had the chance to meet David Mitchell at a conference, which was so cool, and that is just amazing to me. Uh, but Ghostwritten is a novel split into nine parts of nine different people around kind of space and time in the world and how their lives intersect, intertwine, how they affect one another without even realizing it, how like individuals create destiny is basically what this book is about because it's about how the actions of one person like totally interfere and interact and change the actions of another person's life even if um, someone from the front half is in Tokyo, the someone from the second half is in Russia, how their actions affect one another. There is a helicopter. If you've never read David Mitchell, I would really recommend. There's a lot going on in this book that I know I'm gonna have to read it a second and a third time, even though I did read it to get ahead. Um, reading to get ahead in Mitchell is kind of hard because you have to do, like, I would have to do multiple readings because I just find it, um, it is tough. It is tough. I was, I'm gonna say that, but, but it was so good. Four stars. If you've never read Mitchell, do it. You'll be doing yourself a favor, but yeah. Also, I just want to say, obviously, those are not all the works we're working with, but the ones that I can physically show you, I have, kind of, you know what I mean? The rest are obviously in an anthology, and I don't want to pull that out, so anyway. The last three plays that I'll talk about for my Athenian drama class, we have The Oresteia by Aeschylus, so uh, I have already read this. This is about Agamemnon at first and his return from Troy with Cassandra. Obviously, he gets the big stabbed by his wife, Clytemnestra, and then it's about uh, his son and daughter and what they do and yeah. Anyway, I have read this. I gave it three stars, maybe three and a half. Um, I did really like it and I do really like Aeschylus, so I'm really happy that um, this is on like the syllabus. I'm like obviously it's on the syllabus. Aeschylus is, uh, he's arguably the first uh, tragedy writer, so um, I'm excited about this. Next, we have one that I did read over the summer. I buddy read it with Ashley, and that is The Three Theban Plays by Sophocles. So Antigone, Oedipus the King, and Oedipus at Colonus. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what this is about. It's about the story of Oedipus, who marries his mother by accident. It's also about destiny, which is really cool. And uh, I did really like it. Although everyone really, really raves about Sophocles, I did not like him as much as Aeschylus, which is, I don't know. But um, I'm gonna obviously have to reread this and annotate it and just do everything with it. So that's this one. Last, the other kind of physical copy I have to show you Euripides. We have Medea, uh, the Bacchae, and, or the Bacchae, sorry, and. Um, a lot of other ones of Euripides we're reading because Euripides we have I think the most we have the most surviving plays from Euripides he is also the youngest uh, playwright in the holy trinity of Greek playwrights but um, I've never read Euripides yet I didn't get a chance to stumble into him this summer so I'm really really excited uh, the Bacchae is apparently his greatest work I don't really know who decides these things but they've been decided, so that's the last play. So yeah, those are a lot of works, and I didn't even say them all, I just said kind of the major, longer ones, so I'm a little bit scared uh, for this year. If you want to see me stumble through them all, I do do, I do do, I do do weekly vlogs of reading, writing, and obviously college slash university vlogs of what I'm doing. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I've been loving having booktube and like I obviously want to keep doing booktube and mostly book related things, but I am also in the process of writing a book. I do have a few hesitant writing vlogs on my channel. I want to be making more very, very soon, which is really hard when obviously you're a full-time student. I also work part-time at a bookstore and just like, yeah. But anyway, I will be posting weekly vlogs every single week, hopefully, and then another video as well. So, uh, if you have any questions or if you want to talk to me about any of these books, I love talking to people about books. Please come talk to me about books. I will scream back at you about books. But um, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Um, now you know kind of what an English major has to study. I think that's a pretty basic... Uh, plot outline. I think that's a pretty basic outline and framework of what kind of survey full year courses of literature look like and what you have to read. Obviously there are a lot more specialized and more focused and narrowed kind of views for English courses which I don't actually have any this year because I took uh, a few last year like I said I took physics and space and time in literature which is obviously a very focused uh, very kind of tight-knit syllabus as opposed to a survey course but Anyway, I'll stop rambling. Thank you so, so much for watching, and I hope you're having a great day, but I will see you next time. Ciao.